Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the actual Word of God. Now, there have been a lot of requests, and I do mean persistent regular requests via email, the comments section on our different videos, uh, asking us to do a review of a woman who calls herself Apostle Catherine Crick. Well, this is that video, and I'm going to just say this up front. This is a very, very dangerous woman. She is not an apostle of Jesus Christ. She twists God's word severely. And I can already hear the, uh, the comments that are coming in from people who are her followers accusing me of having a religious spirit and being a Pharisee. So we'll talk about that real quick. In fact, uh, we're just going to get right to business. Let me whirl up the desktop and pull up a bit biblical text. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Scripture is very clear that the Holy Spirit, the one who inspired the Apostle John to write these words, that there is an imperative there. And the imperative is, do not believe every spirit. That is a command from God the Holy Spirit. Instead, test to see whether they are from God. Now, a lot of people are going to say, but her fruit is good. She casts out demons. She perform, performs miracles and heals people and stuff and stuff. I, I would note that I have yet to see a single medically verified proof that she's performed a single healing miracle. And then I would also note that scripture is very clear. These are the words of Christ. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Christ tells us to beware of them. You'll recognize them by their fruits. What are the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. Uh, and, and you sit there and go, but she performed miracles and she operates in signs and wonders. That's not the fruit being uh, that Christ is pointing us to. He says, you're going to recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, figs from thistles? No. So every healthy tree bear go bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So a healthy tree cannot bear good fruit. A diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. Uh, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? No, no, it's the false prophets prophesy in the name of Christ. Did we not cast out demons in your name? And oh, yeah, you know. Apostle at uh, uh, Catherine Crick, she, she's casting out demons left and right out of Christians? Hmm. Yeah, and uh, did we not cast out demons in your name and, and do mighty works in your name? Then I'll declare that I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So we're going to test her, and we're going to test her according to scriptural standards. And uh, we're going to note something here. For those of you who want to play the Pharisee card, there's a link down below to this article, uh, written in 2013, the Pharisee card. And uh, this is uh, something that we send to people who, rather than substantively engage with the actual content, the biblical content that we're using to demonstrate that somebody is a false prophet, they instead say, you're just a Pharisee. That's, we call that playing the Pharisee card. Here, here's the card for you. Congratulations, you've been sent this link because you played the Pharisee card. You see, Pharisees are not people who test to see whether or not a spirit is from God. Pharisees are people historically who've added to the scriptures and were teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, Pharisees are heretics, not those defending biblical truth. So, you know, that's, you know, so we'll, we'll put a link to this down below so that we can kind of cut you off at the pass and recognize, again, scripture 
commands us. The Holy Spirit commands us. Do not believe every spirit. Test to see whether they are from God. And always and again, uh, the the go-to test that I give is, how does somebody handle God's word? Are they rightly handling it? Are they proclaiming Christ and him crucified for our sins, pointing us to Jesus, or are they pointing us to themselves? Are they teaching a form of self-righteousness, and do they twist God's word by narcissizing it or eisegeting it. Eisegesis means to read things into the biblical text that are not there. Because the person claiming to be hearing from God, oh, I decree and declare a suddenly and a breakthrough in your life and all this kind of nonsense, right? They open up a biblical text. They couldn't rightly handle it if I wrote the notes out for them and explained, here's how the text is rightly understood. Using the laws, the the, the sound grammatical rules of, of grammar, exegesis and hermeneutics. They, they still couldn't do it. They still couldn't do it because these are people who are sent into the church by the devil to deceive people. And that's exactly what Catherine Crick is. Now, I'm going to make something clear. I have a message for Catherine, and it'll be later in this episode. I will be speaking to her directly and, uh, and addressing what's really kind of at the core of all of this, and that has to do with her own anxieties and fears, but we'll talk about that. So all of that being said, we are going to uh, do just a little bit of a survey here. So uh, you know, as the time we're recording this, this is the current number of uh, videos that are available on our website, and uh, I've taken probably close to two months to kind of work through and get a radar fix on her theology and what she's all about. And, uh, and so this is not something I put together in five minutes. This is something I put together over a long period of time, and it was it just annoyingly difficult to have to walk through and slog through this woman's false teaching. She's a word of faith. She's a false apostle. And we're going to listen to several of her teaching videos. And I'm going to note this. We're going to speed them up, not because I'm worried about copyright or anything like that. We're going to speed them up specifically because there's so much ground we need to cover. And I want to make sure that I can clearly demonstrate I'm not taking her out of context. The doctrines that she's teaching and the way she's mishandling God's word are the proof in the pudding. This is a woman to be avoided. And it's very, very sad that, that, that people within the visible body of Christ are giving this woman a pass or thinking that she's actually bringing anything substantive uh, to them from God or from Jesus. She's not. She is somebody who is clearly deceived and deceiving others. I, I do not think she's intentionally deceiving. I believe she's fully bought into the false doctrines that she's trafficking in, and she does not rightly handle God's word at all. She's incapable of it. So all of that being said, I would note that you know on her channel, there are lots of videos of people having demons cast out of them and stuff like that. And we've already pointed out that Christ in Matthew 7 says, on the last day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? And I would note, she reminds me of somebody that I've been aware of for decades, and that's Bob Larson. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, there's no meaningful difference between the two of them. And uh, I'm unimpressed, the best way I can put it. And other channels have noted that some of the people who are having demons cast out of them, uh, you know, they have the lucidity to hold on to their glasses or, you know, it, it, there's obvious signs that the people who are coming up to be delivered from these demons are engaging in theatrics. At least some of them are. So uh, let's just say that uh, Bob Larson does a better job than she does. Um, but all of that being said, let's, uh, let's do a sample here of her teach apostle Catherine Crick. She's not an apostle. She doesn't have any of the qualifications of an apostle. And in fact, let's let's just kind of do that right now. In Acts chapter one, we recognize what the uh, the rules are for somebody to actually be. And here's the important quote. An apostle of Christ. Now you know in the in the New Testament there are other people that are called quote apostles. Apostle is an emissary. It was a common word back in the day, but for somebody to be an apostle, that means an, so an apostolos is somebody who is sent. So if you were to show up and say, "I'm an apostle," somebody in the ancient world would say, "Well, all right. Well, who sent you?" 
because an apostle is somebody sent by another. They have the authority to operate in the name of the person sending them and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, they, they, they have very specific abilities granted them to them by the person who sent them. All right, that's the the role of an emissary. They don't get to change the message or anything like that, but they have been given authority to do particular things. The apostles of Jesus, you see, that's why Paul says he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. To be an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's something very different. So when you see in the in the New Testament, you have you know, like Barnabas is called an apostle. The question is who sent him? He is an emissary of the Church of Antioch. That's, that's the way in which he is an apostle. So if you understand how the word is used in the ancient world, you recognize then why some are called, quote, apostles. But the apostles of Jesus Christ, those are only created by Christ. Only created by Christ. They are only sent by him. Even the apostle Paul makes it clear that he is an apostle abnormally born, and yet he is an apostle of Christ. That's why his stuff is in the scripture, and Barnabas's isn't. All right, because Barnabas isn't an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's an apostle of the church of Antioch, sent by the church on a missionary journey. So if you're going to use the word like that and say, well, I, you know, I'm an emissary. You know, missionaries from time to time have been called apostles, and rightly so, not because they have special, you know, they have a special anointing or whatever to be an apostle. No, but because they're an emissary of a church or a church body sent to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the apostles in that sense, are have never been considered to be apostles of Jesus. So the idea then um, that uh, in the book of Acts chapter 1, uh, we hear about what they ended up doing in order to uh, you know fill the the vacancy in the uh, apostles of Jesus Christ. There was a vacancy, and so they had to fill it. So in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, this is Acts 1, and the company of persons was in about, uh, was, uh, was about 120, said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted a share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akadalma, that is, the field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there not be one to dwell in it, and let another take his office." So one of the men who have, a con who, who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day we was taken up, one of these men must become with us, come with us a witness to his resurrection. Big thing. You know, in order to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, sent by Christ, uh, yeah, you need to be a, an eyewitness to the resurrection. The Apostle Paul fits that bill, by the way. So, and they, so they put forward two, uh, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, you, Lord, you know the hearts of all. So which, show which one of these two you have chosen and to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. So they cast lots. And the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles becomes part of the 12. Matthias does. All right, so they prayed, Lord, which one have you chosen? The lot fell on Matthias. That's the one Lord chose. That's how that worked. He said there, they threw dice. You betcha. That's what they did for Matthias. But notice he had to have those requirements. And so when it comes to apostles today, there aren't any. There are no apostles of Jesus Christ. And Ephesians chapter 2 makes this very clear. Uh, you know, there's no living apostles. Um, and, and so you'll note that in Ephesians chapter 2, we have these words, and, I, and I'm going to kind of back this up. Therefore, remember at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, you were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of, the, of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no no hope and without God in the world. By the way, this is all of us. 
uh, you know, before we are Christians, we are alienated, strangers. We are by nature objects of God's wrath. That's how Ephesians 2, 3 describes us. But now Christ, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. And boy, this is an important bit. You'll note that although we were born dead in trespasses and sins, and we were by nature objects of God's wrath, that, and that we were under the dominion of darkness and following the passions of this world and the dominion of the air, that Christ has had mercy on us, sent his son to bleed and die for our sins. And those of you who are in Christ, who truly trust in him, he, you have had peace made with you and God by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he was doing on the cross. So that a rebel sinner like you, like me, can be forgiven, pardoned, and brought into the commonwealth of Israel and have the covenants of promise as we look forward to the ultimate fulfillment. And that is the new heavens and the new earth, all given as a gift by grace through faith. All that being said, Christ is our peace, who has made us both one. So in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free. You get the idea. Broken down in his flesh, uh, it broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So the idea then is in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, and there there is no wall of hostility anymore between Jews and Gentiles. We're all one in Christ. So that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers, amen. Those of you in Christ, you're no longer strangers or aliens. You are fellow citizens with all the saints, and you are members now of the household of God. This is the state of peace that we have with God, all because of what Christ has done for us. And you're going to note that we are members of the household of God, watch this, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. And so you'll note then, if the household of God, the church, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You don't lay a foundation twice. You only lay it once. And so the, the apostles and the prophets, we have them. They're still preaching to us today. They're still teaching us today. And you're sitting there going, well, where? Where are our apostles and our prophets? Right here in the Bible, the written word of God. You see, in the, in the front part of it, those are all your prophets. Moses was a prophet. The ones who wrote the histories of Israel, those are prophets. Oh, and the, and the prophets, the major and minor prophets, those are prophets, all right? We, they're still preaching to us. Isaiah is still teaching us. Moses is still teaching us. So is Jeremiah and Amos and Zechariah. You, you, you get the idea here. The, the, all, it's all in there. What about the apostles? Oh, that's the New Testament. In order for a text to be considered part of the New Testament, it either had to be written by an apostle or had to substantively contain the actual preaching and doctrine and teaching of the apostles. That's the idea. So the church, the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We still have apostles and prophets preaching today. Every time you, writ, uh, you know, open up the written word of God and hear it rightly taught, proclaiming repentance and the forgiveness of sins in Christ, placarding the truths of scripture, rightly taught, correctly exegeted, oh God, the Father is speaking to you. And uh, through the apostles and prophets and the church of God, the household of God is being built on that foundation. So we still have apostles and prophets. They're still teaching us. They're the ones who wrote the scriptures, and that's the point here. So we don't have any living apostles today, not in the sense of the 12 apostles of Christ. Now, the church still sends out missionaries, and some church bodies refer to them as being apostles because they are emissaries sent by a church body. I don't particularly like that practice, but I mean, if you, that's the way you're going to use it, I'm not going to quibble too much. But that's not how Catherine Crick thinks of herself as an apostle, something very different. So let's, let's take a listen. I'm teaching about the importance of spiritual eyes being open. Mm, so this is how to be on fire for God. 
And Jill, note this has a lot in common with the uh, the David Edwards uh, video that we just put out, the one before this one. Uh, she's one of these people who's into you know legalistic. She she's the one who's made herself humble enough to to receive these things. She's obeyed enough. She's on fire enough. The fact that there is so much more. There's so much more of God. There's so much more of the kingdom of God. There's king. There's kingdom principles. There's secrets in the kingdom. As God makes it clear in his word, he says, I praise you, Father, that you have reserved these secrets, these secrets of the kingdom, only for these disciples who are childlike, pure in heart. Now, this is where she's engaging in eisegesis. So she's quoting from Matthew 11. Let's take a look at the passage. And this is always where you can tell when somebody is off, way off, when they can't even rightly handle a biblical text, run run. So at that time, here's the text. And, you know, in fact, let me back this up. We'll put this in context. Okay. You'll note that Jesus was one of these fellows who spoke some pretty strong words. So Matthew 11 verse 20 says, then Jesus began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it'll be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Now at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such as it was your gracious will, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except for the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So here's the idea, is, is that uh, the, the wise of Jesus' time, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, note they're Pharisees, and, uh, and they've added to the scriptures, they're heretics. And the Sadducees, what are they? <laughs> they deny that the, the resurrection is even a thing. And so, you know, that's the reason why they were sad, you see. But uh, <clears throat> I apologize. But you get the idea here. In fact, Paul picks up on this same theme. But you'll note, what is Christ pointing to? Himself. Come to me, Jesus says. You who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Heavy laden with the burdens of sin, of legalism, of all of these things, right? Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, in that same vein, then, using the principle of Scripture interpreting Scripture, note how Paul picks up on these same themes themes in 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, and we'll go into part two, uh, a part of two as well. For the words of the cross... The words of the cross, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, the word of the cross, the gospel, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So where is the one who's wise? Are you wise? Hmm? Where's the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach. Notice where the foolishness is. It's in the preaching of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. That's a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. And note, this, this sets the context of what comes a little bit later. All right? And the world, what is they? They look for wisdom and power and things like this. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, who became for us, note, Christ became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Ah, same themes, right? Come to me, Jesus says, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, right? And so when I came to you, brothers, Paul says, I didn't come to you proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or with wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Who, who did the apostle Paul point people to? Jesus. Who does Apostle Catherine Crick point people to? Herself. Pay attention, all right? Paul comes in weakness and he preaches, he chose to know nothing except for Christ and him crucified. Don't you have anything more for us, Paul? Nope. Christ and him crucified. That's all I got. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My Speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith may not rest in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret, a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. When you do the cross-references of this, it's real simple. He's talking about, you know, the mystery of Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory, uh, or, or that, uh, you know, that, that the Gentiles are grafted into Israel as well. You know, do your cross-reference work on this, and you'll see what he's talking about. So, but uh, he's pointing out the fact that he couldn't really go deeper with the Corinthians because they remained babies. That's kind of the point of what follows next. So, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Now, none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Now, the rulers of the age, you know, Herod and Pilate and the, the Sanhedrin and, the, you know, the, the scribes and even the leaders of the Pharisees, those heretics that they were, right? They didn't understand that, the, the real wisdom of God at all because if they had, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us. Through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And what did he say that he chose to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified? The great secret, the big mystery is the gospel. Right? So, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Natural person doesn't accept these things, the, the things of the Spirit of God. They, they're folly to him. Remember? The Jews seek signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ and him crucified for our sins, stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles. The natural person doesn't accept these things of the Spirit of God, they're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is, himself is to be judged by no one. For who's understand the mind of Christ, a mind of the Lord, so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So then, no, then Paul goes on. I, I, brothers, I, I, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for it. Right, because there was still jealousy and strife among them, and all that kind of stuff. He can even move on to the deeper things of the of the revelation. You know how the old and test old testament points to Jesus, the prophecies. You know all the kind of stuff. He couldn't even go that deep because there, there were there was jealousy, and so, so well, I follow Paul. All right, so watch this. So I couldn't address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. You were not ready for it. Even now, you're not ready for it. You're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you? Are you not of the flesh, behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. 
He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And uh, this plays, by the way, perfectly into what goes on with Apostle Catherine Crick. Because who does she point people to? Herself. That's who she preaches about. So I, I would challenge Apostle Crick's followers. Why, why do they sound like the, uh, the, the infants that Paul is correcting in Corinth? I follow Apostle Catherine Crick. Well, I got news for you. I follow Christ. Uh, no one else. And uh, by the way, I'm nobody. All right. So the, we, we got some big problems here. Let's see where she's You've actually going. hidden them from the proud, the know-it-alls. I praise you, Father. So this is powerful. It reveals that there are... Okay. Watch how she twisted that text by eisegeting, adding things to it that are not there. This is Matthew 11, 25. Only for these disciples who are childlike, pure in heart. And you've actually hidden them from the proud, the know-it-alls. I praise you, Father. So this is powerful. It reveals that there are deeper mysteries, secrets in the kingdom. The, the something more thing. It reveals this by this by the scripture, and, and God makes it clear in His Word that not everyone will understand the spiritual things, as it says in First Corinthians two two fourteen. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Now, note she's quoting First Corinthians two fourteen way out of context. We just read it in context, so we know what it's talking about. I ain't talking about this. Watch where she goes with For this. they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Passion Translation says, someone living on an entirely human level rejects the revelations of God's spirit. The, the what? Uh, so she thinks the Passion is a real translation. It's not. The, it shows you she has no discernment. If she were a true apostle of Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit speaking to her? Why wouldn't God the Holy Spirit tell her to, you know, put that passion translation away? For they make no sense to him. He can't understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered by the illumination of the Spirit. <laughs> That's not what the text says. The passion translation there is, let's just say, adding a whole lot of stuff that isn't in the and text. And so many Christians think that just because you're a Christian, you're spiritual. You can understand the things of the Spirit. But that's not true at all. There are Christians who are just as carnal as non-believers. There are Christians who are being used by the enemy even just as much as non-believers, simply because they are carnal-minded and they don't understand the things of the Spirit. And when I say things of the Spirit, I'm talking about how, how the spiritual realm works, the principles. Uh, so things of the Spirit is how the spiritual realm works. This is where she's going to be adding a whole lot of things to this text that are not there. How we can actually be a vessel of God. How God can actually flow through us. How we can actually receive anointing, receive impartation. Anointing, that would make you a Christos. That would make her a false Christ. Receive power of God to do the things that we see Apostle Paul doing and Apostle Peter to receive power of God to do the things that they are doing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone was doing the things Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter were doing. Right, because those were the signs of the apostles. And nowhere in scripture is somebody chastised for not doing the same signs as the signs of the apostles. In fact, let me do this real quick. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. So, you know, why is it that every Christian wasn't able to raise the dead and heal the sick? Because those were the signs of the apostles. Those were the signs. And so, you know, so like, you know, when one, that one lady, Tabitha, dies, what do they do? They send to Peter and say, you got to come. And he comes and raises her. And he didn't chastise them and say, well, why didn't you raise, him from, uh, raise her from the dead? Because Peter is an apostle of Christ. As an apostle, the apostles were given, these apostles of Jesus, they were given signs by Christ to validate their ministry that they were sent by Christ in the same way that Moses received signs from Yahweh, that he was sent by God to, you know, to deliver the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Right? That signs of the apostles, kind of an important category. We continue. There's a way to receive the power of God. There's a way to be a vessel of him. And in the same way, there's a way to be used by the enemy. There's, there's a way that some people have demonic oppression or possession. There's a way that that happens. There's a door in the spiritual realm that opens up and allows the enemy. 
Uh, like a portal? To have authority on one. There's these deeper things. There's these meat. This meat. This meat. So the meat is operating in the signs of the apostles. It says no biblical text anywhere. And you have to move from milk to meat if you want to be used by God. I do. Okay. All right. So what does that mean? And if you want to stay protected from the enemy's scheme. I am so passionate about Jesus and I am so passionate about his kingdom. I, I, I am so passionant. I, I, you, who are you preaching about there, Catherine? Yourself. I did not always used to be this way, though. Yeah, that's right. You're, you, you glow in the dark. You, you've done enough. You've humbled yourself enough. You've obeyed enough. No, the legalism here. I was a lukewarm Christian for a lot of my life. I've been a Christian since I was four years old, since I was a baby. My whole life I've been a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus when I was four. I remember. This is the same self-righteousness as we saw from David Edwards. Okay, but I was a lukewarm Christian for, for up until uh, five and a half years ago. I was a lukewarm Christian. Um, and I loved God. She's not anymore, I, though. I loved God, and I didn't want to be lukewarm. And I wanted to be surrendered. I wanted to be on fire. I understand that that was... I wanted to be surrendered and on fire. Fire is a bad thing. Right, and important. Um, but I was, like, stuck. And there was something that happened that moved me from being lukewarm to now on fire and so passionate for Jesus and she's so passionate for Jesus uh -huh. once that thing broke once that once I shifted to that place okay grab your prophecy bingo card she shifted I never returned and I literally like stayed on fire since that moment was there an atmosphere um, there's a fan a breakthrough flame you have to do I'm not saying that it's all it's not all about feelings but the fire never went away what was this experience what what changed me so the experience. Uh -huh. So drastically. What made me so full of passion for Jesus and his kingdom? Mm. Why do you preach about yourself so much if you're so passionate about Christ? Very simple. Very simple. Very simple. My spiritual eyes opened up. She's enlightened. She's like the Buddha. She's had an enlightenment experience. That's it. That's the secret. The secret. Gnosticism. How did my spiritual eyes open up? I encountered God's true kingdom. Before, I hadn't encountered his true kingdom. Yeah, well, based on how you twist scripture, doesn't sound to me like you, have, you haven't you have yet encountered Christ's true kingdom. Because his true kingdom is built on what? Humble sinners forgiven by Christ who know nothing except for Christ and him crucified for our sins. Now, uh, the power of your words, I want you to listen to this real quick, because this will uh, form a bigger part of my criticism of this woman's false theology. I want you to hear how she tears down the concept of humble prayer. Okay, she's a decreer and a declarer, and the name of the message is the power of your words. And she, she preaches at a park in, in Los Angeles, you know, as part of her... Yeah, of, her, of the revival that you know, she claims is happening there under her, under her spiritual apostolic leadership. That was such force and she was full of peace. That was a testimony I shared just a little bit ago. Talking about a girl that she cast a demon out of. Her. How she's free now. It happened, not just, not me being like, Jesus, free her God. No. So, no, she's mocking the concept of asking humbly for things of God in prayer. It didn't happen by my, me saying, please, Jesus. No, no, no. It no, happened listen. by us being like, let's all together pray, Lord, help this girl here. No, it came. No, it didn't happen by us saying, Lord, help this girl. How did it happen? How, how? By me using the authority God's given me, doing exactly what Jesus did. You're not Jesus. Speaking to the demon. Speaking to the darkness. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Um. These words are spirit. So her words are spirit, and she, she, she doesn't she, she doesn't pray. I mean that that's just so powerless. Well, let's test that one also. All right. So um, let's see here. I'm going to go over here. So, the Apostle Paul, writing in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, 
ta- writing to the ch- saints in the church at Colossae. So from the day we heard, heard about your faith. In fact, let me back up so you can see this in context. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And by the way, word for prayer, pros ukomai. Let's take a look at what that means in the Greek, because I think you will find this to be helpful. Pros ukomai has a meaning. And so when we here's our Greek word for to pray, pros ukomai. So here's what pros ukomai means. Look at this. To petition deity. To pray. Pros ukomai is all about asking God. So, you know, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we petition, we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Let me, let me see this. And uh, in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it does among you also, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learn it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. And so from the day we heard, we heard about your faith, we have not ceased to, there it is again, prosukamai, to petition, to pray, to pray for you, asking. If you're not sure that prayer is all about asking, he says it right there. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Hmm. So, you know, Paul prays. He, you know, asks God for stuff. Um, and, and, you know, Colossians 4, it says, at the same time, pray also for us. Prasukamai. He doesn't say decree and declare. What does he say? Ask. Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to, become, uh, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And then, you know, 1 Thessalonians 3, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face. No, Note here, as he's praying that he can see the saints in the church at Thessalonica. And so he is asking God that they may be able to see them face to face to supply what is lacking in your faith. Uh, and that, that, uh, to this end, we also pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Hmm. It's weird, you know, because uh, the Apostle Paul was a guy who asked God. And that's the thing, is, is that uh, a so-called apostle, Catherine Crick, she, 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 she doesn't ask God. She mocks those who ask. She, she decrees and declares. Huh. I'm speaking spiritual things here. You can't see them. These are spiritual things. But we all witnessed here. We witnessed that when I said, go out now in the name of Jesus, yeah. we saw the force of the demon leave her and fall on Brendan's foot. Her head. Yeah, Jesus says to me, on the last day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? He says, I never knew you. So you're not making a point that's valid, right? Your theology is completely the opposite of what the New Testament says regarding prayer. More proof that you're a false apostle. Now, I'm going to note something here that uh, she she did a video uh, just yesterday, uh, the day before we recorded this, and the, and she, this is where she talks more, you know, people actually are, you know, are, are, are sharing in the chat their different ailments and stuff like this, and she's going to not pray for them. Watch what she does. In that message, for example, Oh, there's impersonators out there, and there's fake prophets out there, and fake apostles out there, and uh, yeah, I mean, she mocks people who actually use discernment. Uh huh. Comes in this way so that you to try to keep you from being childlike and humble because that's he knows the keys. The devil knows the keys, so you have to protect your childlikeness and humility. You have to fight off that urge to be skeptical, to be prideful. You have to fight off that urge of allowing. 
Wait, wait. Scripture says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. See, she contradicts the Apostle John. The devil to confuse you. You have to fight off that urge of allowing people to speak to you things that are not of God when they're coming not with the good fruits and trying to take you away. You have to protect yourself. Only open yourself up and receive. Yeah, see, you gotta, you gotta stop thinking with your mind, man, and just be childlike. Where God's showing you, yes, God's moving here. There's fruit here. There's so many religious people like the Pharisees who said Jesus is, is, is a servant of the devil and here's all this proof and look how he's going against the word of God and look how he's blasphemous. This is what the... And you're twisting that text now too to apply it to yourself and you, you have none of the signs of the apostles and you twist God's word, which is what, well, false apostles The do. Pharisees were saying they would have made all sorts of videos in those times the Pharisees would have blasphemy. So no, she, she doesn't uh, substantively address her critics. She just labels them as Pharisees. They're, oh, they don't have a childlike heart. They're just skeptics. Mm -hmm. Jesus, taking things he said out of context. Look, this one time on a sermon, he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Trying to get people to forget the heart of Jesus. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect your childlikeness. That's what you have to protect. You gotta protect yourself against her haters. And, you know. Thank you, Jesus. Protect yourselves against those Pharisees who have come trying to bring skepticism. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I speak protection over all. Now, this is where you're going to note here. She's not praying. She's not asking God for anything. Listen to what she does here. Now, in Jesus' name, protection over all the enemy's schemes to take you out from where God wants you to receive from. All of the schemes of the devil to plant lies of the enemy in your head. I remove all of that now in Jesus' name. She removed all of that. Oh, wow. Boy, is she powerful. She's not asking God for anything, and she mocks people who pray. And I declare healing to all of you who have had church hurt in the past. I speak healing to you. I speak that trauma to be lifted. Who are you to speak any of this stuff? Off of you now, in Jesus' name. So, no, she doesn't pray. She decrees and declares. The Apostle Paul prayed. John prayed. Christ prayed. Isn't that weird? Huh, you know, even Jesus humbly asks God the Father for things, but not Catherine Crick. So with that, let's take a look at a little bit of a longer uh, teaching here. Um, <laughs> does a wrong prophecy equal a false prophet? And th the answer is no, no, not according to her. But uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit. I, I, I would note here, Apostle Catherine Crick, lead pastor of Fivefold Church. Uh, scripture forbids women from being pastors. And I'm going to point you to a, a previous episode of Fighting for the Faith. We'll put a link to this also down below. Uh, uh, living Proof That Beth Moore is an Autonomian. This is the episode where we biblically unpack and prove definitively it is a creation order issue as, a re as it relates to the fall, by the way, that women are not permitted to hold authority over a man in Christ's church. Full stop. And we give the, and we unpack the biblical uh, teaching on this to prove that there are no women pastors. And again, living proof that Beth Moore is an autonomian. That's the episode that you want to go for because you know she says she's not only an apostle, but she's a lead pastor of Fivefold Church. No, she ain't. Not, not a church that's related to Jesus Christ. She's in full disobedience to Jesus. So let's, let's take a listen to a portion of this teaching. Fivefold Church is the name of our church. And the reason that God gave us that name is because he is restoring the fivefold ministry to the church. Now, this is an important bit. I've been telling you for a long time. Uh, those people out there say, you know, Rosebro, you're just a cessationist. Ah, uh, see, in the charismatic and Pentecostal movements, if you're honest, if you're honest, you're not a cessationist or a continuationist. You're a restorationist. So listen to what she says here. She's claiming she's an apostle. Why? Because God is restoring apostles and prophets. Where have they been? They've been missing for 2,000 years. But thankfully, God's restored one of them to us, and it's an apostolate. Uh huh. Not that he ever wanted it to go away, but we haven't seen the fivefold ministry in the body of Christ by and large, really, since the Acts Church. So listen to what she just said. And then she's going to claim that this is vital for spiritual growth to have apostles and prophets, but it's been missing since the Acts Church. 
Really? Now, the fivefold ministry is the ministry of the five offices that it mentions in Ephesians 4, 11. Jesus says, as he ascended to heaven, he gave the church, he gave the believers, the body of Christ, gifts. And these gifts were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. This is Ephesians 4, 11. Yeah, we've already took a look at Ephesians 2, where it says that the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We still have apostles and prophets today. Yeah, you know, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, the Apostle Matthew, the Apostle Paul. The, you know, you get the idea here. They're still preaching to us today. We have the po- prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Moses and Amos. And, and it says know. that he gave the church these gifts specifically for a purpose, for a very important purpose. And that purpose was for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That- so th- th- we need apostles today, but well, there haven't been apostles since the Acts Church, she said. This is vital to you know prepare the body of Christ for ministry and stuff, but we haven't had apostles and prophets since the Acts Church. If it's vital, then why were they gone? We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickier- trickery of men in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies uh, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So to sum it up, God gave us all of these offices so that we wouldn't remain baby Christians. In other words, Christians have been baby Christians for 2,000 years. And only now, since he's given us Apostle Catherine Crick, can we finally have mature Christians because he's restoring apostles and prophets today. Does that make any sense to you at all? That we wouldn't be lukewarm Christians, but that we... There were only lukewarm Christians until God restored apostles. Be mature, powerful, grown-up vessels of God who were mature in wisdom and discernment, could walk as a, not as a baby who needs babysitting, but can identify. So every Christian from the time of the Acts until now were baby Christians who need to be babysat, but there were no babysitters. Identify lies of the devil that come in the mind and, and, and can powerfully have victory all of the time. Who, who knows the word of God, who understands the word of God, who has had a revelation of the word of God, who has received impartation of the power of God. So the power of God is flowing through them. God never intended us to be just churchgoers on Sunday, lukewarm, one foot in the world, baby Christians who constantly... That's another thing. You're dealing with false dichotomies here now, too. And you say you're an apostle of Jesus. We get beat up by the devil and who are constantly beating up brothers and sisters because they're not mature in the Lord. But how could they be mature? There were no apostles and prophets until you came along. God never intended that, but he intended us to be mature and powerful. So how do we get that way? Well... He tells us, this passage I just read to you, Ephesians 4.11, he tells us, this is how the body, you, can be mature, a mature, powerful vessel of God who won't be deceived by the enemy, who won't be deceived by a different false doctrine that comes. And yet you're teaching false doctrine. You, every time you handle a biblical text, you twist it. We've demonstrated that clearly. But you will be mature in wisdom because of the anointing that all of these different offices of ministry carry. The anointing, again, Christos in uh, Greek, that would make you a false Christ, not just merely a false apostle. So when you are receiving the ministry of an apostle right now, for example, you are not just hearing words, you're not just hearing teaching, but you're receiving impartation. Mm, Impartation, another prophecy bingo word here. The anointing of the apostle, the purpose of the... I'm receiving your anointing? I don't think so. Apostle is they help lay the foundation. They teach foundational truths and they make sure that you grow. If you were teaching foundational truths, you wouldn't be twisting God's word. Sure. Um, that you are protected from the enemy's schemes. They help prepare the way for prophetic ministry, for the prophets. They care so much that the believers would be mature and strong. That's why they're so in the foundation. They build the foundation. So, there, you know what, if, if you were just mature, you'd be all about protecting the apostles. It's all about them, you know. And then they maintain the foundation. So they have a special grace of care for the believers. Care about your maturity. Care that you wouldn't be deceived. Oh, you have super special care for, for maturity in the body of Christ. 
yet you sound exactly like the immature believer that Paul is chastising in 1 Corinthians 3. Care that you could be a powerful vessel. That's, that's an anointing of the apostles. So you are receiving this impartation of wisdom, of maturity, of growth, as you, in Revelation, as you receive. You're in the place of receiving, not just listening like you can listen to a speaker, any old speaker or the TV, but you should be in the posture right now of receiving. This is my time to receive impartation power. Of so I need to be in the posture of receiving. Which biblical text admonishes us to be in the posture of receiving? I don't, I'm not familiar with a single one. God, to truly grow in the spiritual realm, not grow in worldly knowledge, but grow in the spiritual realm. Hallelujah. So um, we see so much immaturity and so much uh, confusion in the body of Christ because yeah, you're sowing a lot of that confusion with these false teachings of yours. We don't have all five offices because we don't have apostles, because we don't have prophets. By, I'm saying by and large right now. So right now, God is restoring the fivefold ministry to the body of Christ. Yet it's vital that we have them, but they've been gone for 2,000 years. Uh-huh. That is very exciting because... No, you're a false apostle, lady. That means we are going to look like how the Acts Church looked and beyond. Yeah, you don't look anything like the Acts Church because you don't sound anything like you're teaching the doctrine of the actual apostles. So it, later in the video, she she talks. She's uh, from a, a text in Second Chronicles regarding Micaiah, um, the the prophet Micaiah and Ahab and and uh, and uh, uh, not Jeroboam but Jehoshaphat. Um, Micaiah prophesies and it makes uh, Ahab upset. But listen to what she does here because she's going to say that if you're a true prophet that you know, your words will come true but then she gives herself a, a way out listen to this the lord has not spoken through me let me back that up just a little bit here we if, go. if you return safely the lord has not spoken through me yeah words then he Micaiah. added mark my words all you people so he says if you ever return safely the lord has not spoken through me so that's revealing that when a prophet speaks it must happen Except for for her. Watch what she does. It has to happen. Yeah. Uh -huh. When a true prophet speaks an event like this, like going to war and this is who's going to win. King a you mean like when a prophet says who's going to win an election? You know, things like that. Who's going to die or who's going to live or who's going to win or who's going to lose. Certain like big events like this, if a true prophet speaks it, it has to happen. If a so-called prophet speaks it and it doesn't happen, they are not a true prophet. Okay. But what about you, Catherine? What about you? Um... Now, when a true prophet speaks to an individual, like in my case, my case, a prophet spoke to me, you're called to be an apostle. But that requires obedience on my part. If I chose to say, I do. So if you give a prophecy to an individual person, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't have to happen. It, you know, it, it may not happen. If it doesn't happen, it's your fault. I want to be an apostle. I do not want to hear this. I do not want to obey what God said through you, prophet. I'm going to keep. God never told you to be an apostle. Whoever told you that was not telling you words from God. I need to keep doing what I was pursuing. That's not going to come to pass. I'm not going to automatically just become an apostle. That's not, never going to happen. So when it's a prophet directing somebody, which requires their obedience, that's a different case. It's conditional. The person has to obey. But so I individual prophecies, if that doesn't happen, well, that's your fault. The person does obey. It must happen. I'm, and I'm so blessed for that in my life. I'm telling you, I'm so blessed, so blessed by the office of the prophet in my life because God prophesied through him to me, gave me prophetic direction of even what God wants me to do. He was a false prophet because you are not an apostle of Christ by any stretch of the imagination. You're one of the false apostles that Paul warns us about in 2 Corinthians. Let me explain. In 2 Corinthians, Paul, you know, it, actually, I think it's in 11. Hang on a second here. There we go. Yeah, the Apostle Paul warns us about the false apostles. And um, he says this, and what am I doing? I, I, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms that we do. And that's what Ka uh, Catherine Crick does. For such men, in her case, w uh, she's a woman, such men are false apostles. They're deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of, of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Now, I promised that I had a message specifically for Catherine Crick, and I do. And, um, and so here's my message to you, Catherine. You need to repent. 
you are a false apostle. You are also a false prophetess, and you are blaspheming the one true God. You are trafficking in false signs and false wonders, and you are deceived, and you are deceiving people, and you need to repent. If you do not repent, then note that Scripture is very clear that God does not hold someone guiltless who takes his name in vain. You have hijacked the name of our God, Jesus Christ, and you are slapping it on your false teachings and your false doctrines, and you do not rightly handle God's word. In other words, you're leading people to hell, and you're sending yourself there. And I'm not saying this because I hate you. I'm saying this because I love you enough to tell you the truth because people clearly have not been telling you the truth and you've cut yourself off from those who do. So you know what I'm gonna do for you, Catherine? I'm gonna pray for you because you don't pray. You do not ask God for anything. You are deluded enough to think that you have power to decree and declare things with your words. You don't. Not even the apostle Paul did that. Instead, he humbly petitioned God. And so I will humbly petition God on your behalf. So. If you would like to join me in praying for Catherine Crick, join your thoughts and your prayers with mine as we petition our great God in heaven to have mercy on her and to have mercy on those who are listening to her. We pray. Lord Jesus, you warned us that in the last days there would be a proliferation of false Christs, false prophets, false teachers, false signs, false wonders, and that even in the days immediately before you return, that false prophets and apostles would be able to perform great signs and wonders to mislead, if possible, even the elect. We recognize that the devil has been deceiving people from the beginning, all the way going back to our first parents. And so we humbly ask you to please have mercy on Catherine Crick. Have mercy on her, Lord Jesus, and set her free from the delusion that she is under. She has been spun around by the devil, and she is doing the devil's work. We pray that you would have mercy on her. Open her eyes to her deceitfulness. Open her eyes to the deception that she is under. Open her eyes, we ask, Lord, please have mercy on Catherine Crick. Release her from the demonic realm that has blinded her and set her free in you as a forgiven blasphemer. Bring her to true repentance so that she may rejoice with all the forgiven saints in the mercy and the forgiveness that comes from you. We pray that you would give her assurance of your great love for her, not in the false signs and wonders that she's trafficking in, but instead that you would give her assurance of her salvation because you have demonstrated your love for her in that Christ has bled and died even for her. We pray, Lord, that you would break through your power all of the deception that is being spun out into the world, into the internet, and all places on the globe because of this woman's deceptions and that you would set her free and bring her gloriously into your kingdom. We ask all of this humbly coming before you, Lord, knowing that you hear our prayers and that it is not your will that any should perish, including Catherine. Please forgive this blasphemer and please bring her to repentance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Catherine, the peace you are looking for and you still do not have, I can see it in your face and in your manners. The peace that you are looking for will not be found in you thinking that you have a right relationship with God because you can command and con control or decree or declare or operate in signs and wonders or are even fulfilling the prophecy that you are an apostle. You're not. The peace you are looking for will only come when you humbly accept that you are a sinner and a blasphemer. And the thing is, you already know that you are. You know that this, all of this is a scam. You know that you are not for real an apostle. And so why, why continue on with the pretense? Repent. Jesus will forgive you and he will give you the peace that you're looking for. 
and the forgiveness and mercy that you are so such in need of. I pray for you and we'll continue to pray for you. Now, if you found this video helpful, all the information on how you can share it is down below in the description. And until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Thank you.